we come and, and dispose of our offering. I want to just share something that you know has been on my mind about in terms of offering and tithing. And, you know, we live in a generation where giving is not the way that we're brought up or the way that we're taught, whether it be in schools or you know, in how to get rich quick. You know, um, we live in a generation where we always want and want and want and we're never satisfied no matter how much we have. You know, we can look, just look at, you know, TV and social media. These celebrities, these millionaires, no matter how much they have, they're never, never satisfied. And maybe, you know, that's us sometimes. Sometimes, you know, we're not happy with what we have. We're not happy with what God has blessed us with. And, you know, I, I ask you if, we cannot bless God with what we have now. How do we expect Him to bless us with more? And it's something that if we really think about, you know, it should it should trigger something in you. Because maybe you are just getting by it. And maybe it will hurt you to give a dollar or two today. You know, I, I know there have been times in my life when, you know, I was working um, for my school or at a newspaper and giving ten dollars meant that I would have to ask my parents for gas money that week and and sometimes it's gonna hurt but through those hurtings our faith is going to stretch and if our, if our faith doesn't stretch we're never going to learn how to become that greater person that we want to be and we're never gonna be able to learn how to lean on God it says in the Bible that you know put uh, God's kingdom first and he'll provide us with what we need and that's taking a step of faith and right now as you bring your offerings just keep that in mind that knowing that no matter what happens no matter what your bank account says God is going to give us what we need
really just absorb this atmosphere. This is an awesome atmosphere to be around. And I, I want them to see the part where, they, where it says that Jesus changes everything. Because he does. 2,000 years ago, Jesus changed everything. Everything. Everything about us, about the world, and about people. He changed everything. And today, I'm supposed to talk about worship. And I just feel like there's just this presence of worship in this place that we can just seek into. That we can just seek into because God is wanting your heart. God wants your heart this morning. So as they sing that part again, I want you to really just absorb that heart, that atmosphere, wherever you are. It doesn't matter if you're standing, it doesn't matter if you're sitting, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but absorb that revelation that Jesus changes everything.
you can shake somebody's hand. Maybe you haven't said hi to somebody, but say hi to somebody. And it's Mother's Day, so greet somebody and tell them, you know, Happy Mother's Day. We have some special gifts for him, for people here, and even probably we have some gifts for people who forgot to buy their mom and something for Mother's Day, so you might get lucky this morning. But you can stay just you. You're my lucky, you're, you're my lucky participant today. You can stay. Everybody else can chillax, relax. You can take your seats, guys. Everybody can take their seats. So today, I have the privilege to introduce our new sermon series called Connect. And I'm just going to step right into it. And uh, we're last, last sermon series, we had an intro for the actual series. But this time, we're just going to step right into worship. Because this morning I want to talk about worship and I've been studying and God has just been speaking into my life and been changing my worship because he wants to change your worship. And God wants to do something amazing in your life this morning, but you have to decide and want to be part of that change this morning. So I want to start with, I don't know if anybody's been on Facebook, we have a video. It's not ready for us this morning, but... but in the video, the message that was being, you know, spoken was that the simplicity of the gospel, basically the simpleness of the gospel, is connecting to God spiritually and practically with people. And when we begin to connect to God, Spiritually, we become empowered to connect people practically. Because a lot of times we meet people who are just like, how do you live this Christian life? Has anybody ever said, okay, you know what, I want to live this Christian life, but how do you start? And then we're just like, go to church. That's your answer. And, and that's the easy answer, you know, go to church. You know, we're, we're quick to say that. But I want to tell you this morning, that it's deeper than that. And I want to talk about the heart of worship. Because I think if we fail to know what worship is, or the essence of worship, if we fail to have the essence of worship living inside of us, then we cannot live the life that God wants us to live. Because God wants us to live a life of worship. Worship is not something you do worship. Oh, that's a really good graphic. That's a really good graphic. You know, Golly did a, an exceptional job, you know, on this one. But worship, I lost my train of thought. But worship is so important and vital to our spiritual lives because without it, we cannot live. I want to talk about a few things before I get into actually worship. And if you have your uh, Google dictionary, uh, the word connect will actually... There's people taking out that they're act, they brought their dictionaries with them, but there's there's people or, or there, there's uh if you look in the dictionary it actually says connect and it means to join to link or fasten together. There's actually a definition that says to even begin communication between or to start communication with someone. That's what it means to connect. And that's why worship is so pivotal to connect. Because worship is our heart connecting to God. How can we live a lifestyle of Christianity if we fail to have a connection to God? How can we live this life crazy for Jesus if we fail to demonstrate the freedom and joy and peace and security that is found in Jesus in us? Because the crazy thing about the gospel is everything that God is, you are. Because He lives inside of you. Our hearts long for this connection. We live life longing for connection we live life longing for this connection and sometimes we seek it in relationships sometimes we seek it in friendships 
And when somebody's not being good to us, we're just like, oh, well, nobody loves me. You know, nobody cares about me. You know what? No one likes me. I'm no good for nothing. Oh, well, this, this thing that I have is not good. And because that's not good, everything in my life is not good. Because we seek validation in things that were never supposed to validate you. And a lot of us are stuck in this moment. Why? Because we want relationships and we want people to validate our gift or validate us working in our gift or validate us as people. But it was always worship that was supposed to do the validating. Why? Because that's God validating you right where you are. Connection does so many things for the body of Christ. Connection does so many things for us as people. But one of the important things that it does, it gives us the ability when we connect with God, it gives us the ability to live a life for God. Because without connection through worship, we cannot live a life that demonstrates what God has or who God is. A lot of times we, we want to do a prayer. If I ask this one question, it's the question that everybody asks all the time. Who wants to fulfill their purpose? And every hand in the church shoots up. Every, every person wants to fulfill the purpose that God has for their life. But a lot of us that are raising up our hands fail to realize that without connection, we cannot fulfill it. Because purpose once you get this sense of feeling when you talk about purposes you want to change people's lives right a lot of us we want jobs that are changing lives is that everybody you know we don't want to just work a mundane job and the same old thing repetitive thing over and over and over and it means nothing that drives humanity crazy to do that because that means that you bring nothing to the table purpose gives you an assumption of feeling that you want to change somebody's life. But before that we can connect with a people group and change their lives through the gospel, we first have to connect with God. And how do you do that? We connect with worship. We connect with worship. And that starts in a small setting like this. Because when you get into a larger setting, it's hard to change the culture of something that wasn't existing already. Because what happens is you have to have that heart and, we, and that heart has to jump on you and you and you and you. And the more people there are, the harder it is. So this is the best time to create that culture. This is the best time to say, you know what? I can't take another step until I connect myself with God. I cannot take another step in, in acting like everything's good and everything's all right and, true and everything's good. But I'm dying on the inside because I have no connection to the creator of my soul. I have no communication to the one that loves me. And I'm, I'm acting like everything's okay when it's not. And that's how sometimes we as the church, we take it, you know what, let's have an awesome service, you know, a three-point message, and that's great, and let's, let, let's send everybody with, with, with gifts and all of that, and all of that is good, you know, it, it, you know, you can drink your coffee before church, or you can bring it to church, or, or whatever, and that's awesome, but that's not the essence of what the gospel is. The gospel is here to change your life. The gospel is here to make you a better version of yourself. The gospel is here so that you would connect to the Father and you would fall so in love with Jesus Christ that it would radically, supernaturally, irreversibly change everything in your mind. That's what the gospel is all about. Worship is simply sharing your heart in a state of rest with God. Worship is not a song, it's, it's an attitude, it's a lifestyle that we possess. Worship doesn't end when you drop your instrument. Worship doesn't end when you leave practice. Worship doesn't end when you leave service. Worship doesn't end when you walk out the church doors. Worship becomes an attitude that you possess. Worship becomes a lifestyle that you live. It becomes the breath that you breathe. It becomes the steps that you walk. It becomes the actions that you live. Worship is meant to be everything. 
everything that you are. And until we realize that, we will never understand and how to teach that and regenerate that and build that culture if we can't as ourselves function in that kind of culture. Worship, I want to bring some history, and I'm, I'm starting already. Don't think I'm still in my introduction. I'm starting already, all right? Because I, I want to worship after this. I don't know about you, but I just want to just worship God because of who He is and because of what He's done. And, and because, you know what? He's a good God, and He looks after me, and He looks after my family, and, and, and He's good to us. Even when we feel like we're in a situation and everything's dark, and He just taps you on the shoulder, and He says, you're the light shine and, 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 and you know, you become the answer to a broken world. He's a good God. Worship in the old covenant. If we go to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7 and if you want to go there, if you're very quick with your Bible app or you're very quick with your Bible, we'll just spin over to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7. And right here, the writer of Hebrews points a pic. He draws a picture of what the old covenant sacrificial worship was. And there was a time in the old covenant when the, only the high priest was allowed to enter the holies of holies. And that's what we see here in Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself for the sins of people committed in arrogance. And this is just talking about the history and, and um, in the old covenant under the law, the high priest was the only one that was able to partake in this sacrificial worship to God. And, you know, me and Nikki were talking about how they used to put a bell around the high priest because if he wasn't right with God, he would drop dead in the tabernacle. He would drop dead in the holies of holies. That's like crazy. The standard to worship God was so high. It was so difficult that, it, that nobody could really keep that standard. And they did these sacrifices. And those sacrifices were going were gonna to represent you for one year only. Like 2019, you better bring another sacrifice. Because what you did in January ain't going to cover it. Next January. That's not crazy. You could not come to God without a sacrifice. You could not come to God without committing everything to the team that God had instructed to happen. If someone entered the holies of holies without the appropriate sacrifices, they felt that there's a story in the Bible where somebody touched the Ark of the Covenant and he was not right and he dropped dead because he had no access to that. That was crazy. That's crazy. You're just like, man, good thing I wasn't born in that generation. But that's how difficult it was to worship. And I want to bring to light, like, worship is so free today. It's so easy. It's you sharing your heart with God. Now I want to talk about worship to us, and I'm going to spend probably a little bit more time talking about the new covenant style of worship. And I want to start first by saying Jesus paid the sacrifice once and for all for you to come boldly before, before the throne of God. And we find, you can find that in Hebrews chapter 4, 16, if you have your Bible. Is it on the screen? Hebrews chapter 4, 16. I think we have it on the screen. Hebrews 4, 16, we do have it on the screen. And it says, Therefore let us with privilege approach the throne of grace, that is the throne of God's gracious favor, with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find His amazing grace to help in time of a need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27, 51. I want you to read that scripture as well. Matthew chapter 27, 51. Is it on the screen too? It's on the screen. 
And it says, and at once the veil, the holy of holies of the temple was torn from, it was torn in two from top to bottom, and the whole earth shook and the rocks were split. And that verse is also recorded in Mark, and it's also recorded in Luke. So that's how you know it's a very important scripture. And that's the moment that Jesus resurrects from the, from the tomb, and the veil is torn from top to bottom. The veil was the covering that, that shielded somebody from going into the holies of holies. And that was ripped, and it represented that you have access to that. It represented that God was repairing the breach, that God was changing everything. And I started this by saying, Jesus changed everything, changes everything. That's why I told the worship team, play that song. Why? Because we have to understand that Jesus changed everything. We have to understand that that's for us. A lot of times we take this for granted and we're just like oh worship yeah that's good it makes you feel good you cry a little bit you feel a little bit of goosebumps and that's it but no worship is deeper than that you have access to the throne of god you have access and worship to us in the new covenant is entirely different than what it was in the old covenant in the old covenant you would do sacrificial worship just to make it think about that you would do sacrificial worship. Why? Because you had to or you would die. And then if you did it and you did it wrong, you died to get away. So you're kind of like in some tough waters. But in the new covenant, worship is joy. It's peace. It's freedom. And it's rest. Say that because true authentic worship is when you get behind the mask that we sometimes wear in church. Sometimes we put on a face because we're supposed we're on the platform, everything has to look okay. Oh, you know, I'm doing offering, I have to have it all together. But worship is so much deeper than that, it's getting to the point. Where you realize God puts you right where you are. God meets you right where you are and he loves you exactly the way that you are. And sometimes the most intimate times of worship are the times when there's not even a song playing. It's the times when you're not even like walking around or, or, or however you like to worship, but you're just sitting in awe of who God is. Worship brings a sense of security, a sense of freedom, and a sense of rest. Worship no longer requires anything other than connecting your heart to the heartbeat of God. Worship is not a song. It's not something that you do only on Sundays or on practice days. It becomes a lifestyle that we must possess. It's a lifestyle that we have to that we have to be born into. You know, you can't just say, I'm gonna worship Monday and then I'm gonna party Tuesday and then I'm gonna worship Wednesday and then I'll do whatever I'm gonna do on Thursday and then I'm gonna worship on Friday, then I'll lie on Saturday and then I'll come to church on Sunday and get it all right all over again and start the cycle all over. And sometimes that's what we do as a church. And we mask everything and we put our church mask on and we put our church ma our church clothes mask on. We, we wear our nicest suit or maybe you don't wear a suit. But you wear your nicest clothes and you act like everything's okay and it's actually chaotic on the inside of you and you're just saying God I, I wish you would would do something about what's inside of me and God is saying open up your heart I want you I want you to if you have your Bible maybe if you want to just look on the screen it's Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and it says therefore I urge you brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice holy and well pleasing to God which is rational logical and intelligent act of worship I'm going to say something that's going to change your life it's going to change your perspective 
Worship is no longer bringing a literal sacrifice. It's not what you can give God, but it's realizing what God has already given us as believers. And that's the sacrifice of Jesus. And the next thing that happens after we realize that is that our lives become a living sacrifice for His kingdom. My breath becomes worship and we recognize that we are in Him and He is in us. You see, you can't live worship if you don't know that. That Jesus lives inside of you and you live in Jesus. We are one with the Father. Paul says, as I am in the Father, the Father is in you. We have to understand what that really means. That means that wherever you go, Jesus lives on the inside of you. Worship. I always tell our team this, that worship is an expression of the life that's inside of us. So if our worship needs an upgrade, needs an update, it's probably because there's something wrong on the inside. Because you will only express what you have on the inside. The Bible says out of the, abund out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Eventually what you have inside, you will release. Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, or what one likes, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And, what, and this, you know, the point of what he's saying is the kingdom of God is not, it's not about literal and temporal things of this world. Because sometimes... That's what drives us every day. The literal, temporal things of this world. Money, validation, popularity, fame, and love in all the wrong places. Satisfaction. Those are the things that drive us. But God wants to show you something else. God wants to give you something else. God wants to give you something where you shall be satisfied. And when you receive that, you begin to live the fruit of worship. And it will live inside of you and it will manifest in joy. And you might be like, I'm not happy. This was going to happen or I thought this was going to happen and I'm just not happy with my life right now. Well, just worship a little bit. Just worship a little bit. And in the, have, have, have you ever been going through something and you were at this like conference or something and you just started worshiping and everything else didn't matter because you were, at, you were in the throne of God. Because you were in the presence of God and that was the only thing that mattered in Okay, I'm not happy with where I'm at. I, I, I wish things would have went this way. Or I, I, you know, all these crazy things are going bad in my life. But get in His presence. You know, uh, so, uh, David the psalmist said, "In His presence is the fullness of joy." You want to be happy? Get in His presence. You want things to start falling your way? Get in His presence. You want God to change your perspective? Then get in His presence. You want God to change your situation? Then get in His presence. Because when you're in His presence, who, He's your dad at the end of the day. He wants to give you what you want. He wants to give you what you need. He wants to bless you beyond measure. But we have to be in His presence. It's so important to us. Another thing about the Old Covenant was that when they would make these sacrifices, smoke used to fill the temple. When they would do these sacrifices, smoke would fill the temple. And the smoke was a fragrance to God. And sometimes it smelled really good and sometimes it smelled really bad. And in the New Covenant, the Bible... 
Bible says that we have a fragrance that is sweet to the heart of Jesus. It's sweet to the Father. It smells good. Why? Because the sacrifice was paid in full. And there's not another sacrifice that's needed. He paid for it in full. And if you know anything about smoke, if you have, if anybody's ever been, you know, God forbid, but if anybody's ever been in a fire, you know, you smell like smoke. I remember one time me and my brothers were at home. Actually, it happened to us twice, you know, like once when we were like in high school and then my brother was like in college. And then another time when I was like 10, I don't know, I, I think I was 10. Maybe I was younger. I might have been eight or seven. I was probably younger. And the kitchen's on fire. And because my mom was doing a bunch of things at the same time, not because she's a bad cook. But because he was just doing it, everything, you know, my dad was at work, and my brother was asleep, my oldest brother was asleep, I don't know where Mike was, I honestly have no idea where he was, Maybe, and I was watching cartoons in the living room while the fire is going on, you know, like, I'm like totally zoned into the TV, I have no idea what's going on, and then all of a sudden I see my mom and my brother jumping, then I see the fire department comes in, and it wasn't even a crazy fire, it was like a little pop fire, right? But smoke was there and it got in our clothes. And when it gets in your clothes, you can go to a different room and you still have smell like smoke. You can go to a, uh, you can drive to, if you if the fire happened in Wesco, you can drive to Donna and you're gonna smell like smoke. You can't escape the smoke unless you use detergent, right? But when we get into an atmosphere and a lifestyle of worship, you start smelling like Jesus. And wherever you go, you smell like Jesus. And in the new covenant, the smoke represents Jesus. It represents the sacrifice that was paid once and for all. It represents the sacrifice that is worthy of our worship. And that begins to invade your heart and begins to consume you and saturate you. And you possess that inside of you. And you smell a lot like Jesus. And because Jesus is good, you are good. And because Jesus doesn't have a bad attitude, your bad attitude stays away from you. <laughs> and because Jesus doesn't have a bad and because Jesus is optimistic, and he's like, is that so? That you think this bad situation is all there is? Don't you know that I am hope? And don't you know that Jesus lives on the inside of you? And whenever you step into a bad situation, hope steps on the scene, purpose steps on the scene, a miracle just stepped on the scene, everything needed to change that environment just stepped on the scene. You know, all of us are complaining about certain things in our lives, and, and you're just like, God, change this, do something. You're the answer to that mess. You're the answer. God is, you know, you're just like, God sent somebody to change that. And God is like, you're the answer. You go change it yourself. I've given you and I've deposited you everything that you needed. But that's life, that's life on mission at work, right? We're going back to that. But 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 you have everything that you need, and this is a lifestyle of worship, and, and this is this is everything that you know this the gospel is all about. And we smell a lot like Jesus, and I know that sounds funny. We smell good like Jesus. But worship literally connects you to God. Worship connects you to God. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Worship, if worship isn't authentic and transparent, then it isn't real. And I want to ask you this question, what is your attitude in the middle of worship? What is your attitude towards worship? Worship is literally longing for his heart. Worship is our heart communicating with the heart of God. It's opening up to the creator of our soul. I want to say something that often stops us from actually worshiping God relentlessly. And that's 
Fear and judgment will always keep us from experiencing real, authentic worship sessions. But I want to tell you that God couldn't have been more intimate than giving himself up and saying, I want to live inside of you. He basically said, I want you just the way you are. And I know that you're a mess and I know that you're screwed up and I know that you have all these problems and I know that you can't even do this and do that. But I want to go clean that up for you. I want to become the answer to your life. I know your life may be chaotic, but I choose to live inside of you. And in the middle of living inside of you, he changes everything. God is calling us to intimacy every day. He wants you. And something that we have to understand, and this, and this was something that just wrecked me, is because I see oftentimes we go through these situations or we see people go through these things, but God actually likes you. And God actually wants to live inside of you. And God doesn't just tolerate you. Sometimes we feel like God just tolerates us. God, where are you at? You know, you're not even speaking to me. You're just here because you're God and you're supposed to love me. But he actually loves you and he actually likes you and he actually wants you. And he actually wants to live inside of you. And that's the, that's the raw love of God. It's intimacy. And if you look at that word, what it means is it means into me. Intimacy. You see in me. You see in me. You see me exactly how I am. And the crazy thing is, some of us are very broken people, right? Like we're all very broken people. We all have weaknesses, and we all have things we're struggling with, and we all have things that we can't get right. We all have that one person that cuts us off, and then you just say something you're not supposed to because you got angry because somebody just cut you off. Or that one person that just seems to always just get on your last nerve, and you're just like, I'm having a great day, and that person showed up and said this, and they got on my last nerve, and, and you know, I didn't say it, but I thought it. But that's not possessing a lifestyle of worship. A lifestyle of worship encounters love and is radically changed by the love and then freely gives that same love. I want to say that again. A lifestyle of worship receives that love and is changed by that love and then freely gives that love. Regardless of who it is, regardless of where you're at, regardless of what people might think, this is how the gospel works. And I want to talk about a story. And this is how I'm going to close. I'm going to close with this story. I'm going to close with this story. So I want the worship team to come. I'm going to close with this story. I want you to stand here. about the Samaritan woman. And I want to tell you that she went to this well at this certain time because she was not supposed to be there, first off. So basically, she was an outcast. She was, she had five husbands. And a little bit of history about why she was an outcast. It was not because of something that she did, but it was rather about something that her ancestors did. And during that time, her ancestors, would they would fight, the Samaritans and the Jews, they would fight on where to worship God. That we're supposed to worship God on this mountain. And then the Jews were like, no, you're supposed to worship God in Jerusalem. And because of that, the Jews looked down on and called them and called Samaritans outcasts. And she was going there to get water and she made sure that nobody from the community was there and that nobody would see her and that nobody would talk to her. So she had already this perception that I'm not supposed to be talked to. She had this perception that she's an outcast already. And she had five husbands and first of all, 
one of the things I want to point out about this story is that Jesus meets her. Jesus, so it just so happens to be walking on the scene, you know. Out of all the people that you can bump into, you're going to bump into Jesus. And Jesus bumps into her at the well. And Jesus is probably smiling, right? Because he knows what's just about to happen. And she's probably like, oh no, this is the worst thing that could have possibly happened. Jesus, one of the first things I want to point out is Jesus meets her right where she is. A lot of times we're just like, well, I got to get right and then, I, and then I, can, I can get in the presence of God. I got to get my things right and then I'll get back in the presence of God. But I want to tell you this morning that God will meet you in whatever condition that you're in. God will meet you right where you are. You might be broken and hurting inside, but God will meet you right where you are. this idea that she wasn't supposed to be talked to because she was an outcast. So she felt devalued, she felt unaccepted, she felt unworthy, and she felt she wasn't validated as a human being. And sometimes we act like this with God and we tell God, you know, why are you trying to talk to me? You know, why are you trying, why are there people telling me, you know, hey, go back to church or, or hey, you know, you need to get, you know, make time for God. Why are you trying to do these things to me? And, and, and we just act like that with God and we get selfish and, and we start, what, what this is basically called is a, is a pity party. And we start getting like this with God. But God, and, and Jesus starts to tell the woman, and Jesus tells the woman, you know what? Well, I will, I can give you water, and you'll never thirst again. And then the woman starts arguing with him, and, and just starts debating with him, and, you know, like, she's debating with Jesus, you know, like, this is crazy, this is, this turn is starting to turn into a chaotic scene, like, like, the woman is arguing with Jesus, and Jesus is coming here trying to change her life. And now, and then sometimes that happens to it. Has it ever happened to you? You start arguing with God and God is trying to change your life. You know, God is trying to help you. God is trying to tell you, you know, I love you. You're just like, no, nobody loves me. You know what? I did this. You don't love me. Stop lying to me. You're arguing with God. This happens a lot. And we try to isolate ourselves. We try to do what the woman did. Okay, let me get here before anybody sees me. I want to go to the store. I hope I don't see anybody from church because then they're going to know I didn't go last Sunday. They're going to try to tell me, oh, you need to go to church. You need to, you need to give God an opportunity. You need to do this. You need to do that. And we do this with God. We act like we know better than God. But it's in this moment, Jesus gives her grace. Jesus encounters her. And Jesus tells her again, if you would have asked me, I would have given you water. And you would never thirst again. And you wouldn't have to be looking for something more. And this is the moment that changes a lot of things. And worship is birthed in this moment. And you might say, how is worship birthed in this moment? Because Jesus told her, first off, Jesus prophesied over her and told her about her life. And Jesus already knew the history. He knew, the, he knew what the ancestors had, what her ancestors had did. He knew the dispute. And in this moment, Jesus gives her grace. And Jesus does something and he says, you know what, there's coming a time when people will not worship in the mountain or will not worship in Jerusalem. And that's where you get to John 4, 24. That's where we pick up John 4, 24. And Jesus is now talking. And he said, and he said, there is now a time coming where we will worship in spirit. We will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Because to the woman, worship was a location. To the woman, worship was a song. It was a sacrifice. A 
And Jesus comes on the scene and starts prophesying and says, there's coming a time. There's coming a time when worship won't be on the mountain and worship won't be in Jerusalem. But it will start in your heart. And the woman recognizes who he is, the Messiah, and falls down and worships him. And the crazy thing about this is that woman was not just an outcast. She represented an entire group of outcasts. She represented an entire group of outcasts. And Jesus changed everything in this moment. And what happens in this story is she becomes the first evangelist in the Bible. A woman becomes the first evangelist in the Bible. And she falls down and worships Jesus. And then she goes back to her town and tells everybody about Jesus. Tells everybody about Jesus. And says, you need to go to him. Because he'll give you water and you'll never be thirsty again. She wasn't talking about literal water. She was talking about something spiritual. And you know what the crazy thing is? She left the bucket at the well. She left her water bucket at the well. And I was reading that part and I was like, the very thing that she took so many precautions for, like, let me get there at the right time. Let me make sure that nobody's there because I need water. I'm an outcast. Nobody, I'm never, I'm not going to be able to come back. You know, I, I have to take, and she forgets the water. She forgets the water. And I asked myself when I read that, and I said, what could have been so impacting? And she would have forgot the water. If I'm sneaking in somewhere, I will make sure that I take what I'm sneaking in for. You know, like, not that I'm going to be doing that, right? But, but just think about it. Like, if you're going to sneak in somewhere, you're going to make sure you take what's necessary so you don't have to go back there. And she forgets the bucket, right? She forgets the jar. What could have been so impacting? What could have been so impacting that Peter left his entire family, career, the moment he walked out of the boat and followed Jesus. What could have been so impacting that everything that Saul of Tarsus did for his entire life, he left because a voice told him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What could have been so impacting Change all the lives of all the great evangelists that ever walked the earth. Jesus said, A day is coming here now. Jesus started giving her value. So that's what worship does. Jesus starts giving you value. You might say, I don't have any value. I feel like I, I'm an average Joe, or I have no gifting, or I have no talent, or I have. I don't know what I'm good at. Well, start worshiping and you'll start receiving your value and God will start validating you and you won't need people to tell you, oh, you're a good singer or you're a good preacher or you're a good this or a good that. Why? Because you know who validated you already. You know who loves you, who chose you, who rescued you, who wrapped you up in his loving arms and who wants to live through you. It's a lifestyle of worship. The point Jesus is making is worship is no longer an actual location. But now worship is inside the heart. And when you encounter grace and the love of God, it changes you. She represented every outcast. And the message to her was it doesn't matter where you're from. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus wants you. And Jesus chooses you. And I want to, I, I recall another story. You know, we all know that person I mentioned earlier that touched the Ark of the Covenant and died, right? There was another person that touched the Ark of the Covenant. But this person didn't die. But this person was known after a man after God's heart. 
you know, David, when he messed up and he sinned and he rebelled against God and everything that he did, you know, he, you know, he committed adultery, then he committed murder and a sin after a sin after a sin. And then, and then he has the audacity to touch and lay down on the Ark of the Covenant. But his heart was so passionate for Jesus. David's life began to prophesy of a new covenant. That's why God allowed David to have a special covenant. Because God wanted to draw pictures of what was coming. create that culture of worship where it's a lifestyle where it's everything that we possess where worship doesn't end here team but it's a lifestyle that we possess that it's something that we live that worship goes beyond the notes and beyond the lyrics and beyond the, the systems that we're running and something intimate because we are so in love with the creator of our soul.